presenters. Yes, hi everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, this is Erica Sussman and I'm the executive director and founder of the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. Um, we are thrilled to be hosting today's program and very appreciative of both the faculty and all of you for joining us um, because I know that there's a very rich pool of expertise here collectively. So look forward to both the presentation and the conversation throughout. Um, today's webinar is about addressing tax issues in family law cases with survivors. And I'm just going to briefly um, introduce the faculty and then um, hand it over. So today we are very privileged to be joined by Jamie Andre, who is a volunteer attorney with Indiana Legal Services, um, specifically their Low Income Taxpayer Clinic. We've worked with Jamie as an expert advisor um, with CSAJ for years now and so appreciative of um, all that you bring to our work. Uh, Laura Russell is also joining as um, Laura is the citywide director of the Family and Domestic Violence Unit with Legal Aid Society in New York City. Uh, and Laura Russell also is an expert advisor with CSAJ and has similarly contributed greatly to all of the incredible work of this project. Um, and um, also um, joining us today is Katie Von Delinde, an expert advisor with CSAJ and adjunct faculty at um, Washington University Brown School of Social Work. And, um, also a critical contributor to the Consumer Rights Project, um, of which today's webinar is a part. So um, we, myself and Sarah Wee, who is the Director of Research and Programming, are going to be co-facilitating um, today's uh, webinar, and we're thrilled to have all of you with us. So at this time, I'll hand it over to Sarah for some introductions. Thanks so much, Erica, and thanks again to Jamie, Laura, and Katie for joining us, and all of you. Um, while we're letting folks uh, trickle in, I just want to br briefly or quickly um, review what we're hoping to accomplish today. And while I do that, it would be great to hear from all of you. Um, if you could introduce yourself um, in the chat, let us know your name, your organization, where you're coming from, maybe a question you're bringing with you today. That would be really helpful. We've got a lot of rich expertise, as Erica said. Um, so we're, we're excited to engage with you in the chat as well as um, through the content that our wonderful faculty will deliver today. So we are talking tax and family law. Um, what we're going to cover is why. why. First, why are we talking about that? What do family lawyers need to know about tax? Um, what do tax issues look like in the family law context? How do they show up for survivors? And what can you do to address tax issues in family law cases um, or wherever they might um, show up? We know that we have attorneys, advocates from various spaces and places joining us. So um, we'll look to you for your own insights and, and what you're seeing and needing. Um, our objectives for today are really to understand some of the key important tax concepts that impact survivors, um, including um, some changes with the new tax law that Jamie will go over. We're going to do a lot of issue spotting. Um, we're going to look through some case scenarios to examine how some of these issues show up and can be addressed through family court um, and family law cases. Um, and also describe ways that, again, you, based on your, your role, wherever you are, um, can help address some of these issues. And um, importantly, next week, we're going to continue the conversation. We've got a family lawyer, a tax lawyer, um, advocates, researchers, policy people, um, folks from all levels of work on this call. And next week, on the 17th, we're going to continue talking about partnership and how, um, how to build them, how to use them, how to think about this issue um, more broadly. And that is a very interactive Web webinar where we unmute everybody. So if you haven't already, please register for that, join us, bring some of your colleagues, and come prepared with questions um, and ready to um, engage in actual live conversation. 
Um, so in that spirit, I want to bring all of our faculty uh, to the front of the, the virtual stage here uh, before we really get started um, and introduce themselves as well as briefly talk about um, why why family and why taxes and family law? Why is it important based on your work um, and your experience? Um, so, uh, Jamie, do you want to start us off with a quick intro and what this all means for you? Well, I would be happy to do so. And thank you all for attending. Welcome. As Erica told you, I'm a volunteer lawyer with Indiana Legal Services Low Income Taxpayer Clinic. And in fact, I recognize some of your names that are showing up on the participant list. It's good to have you participating. There are um, a number of reasons why tax information is very important to survivors' economic security. And I want to highlight two of those. First, knowing how to avoid tax debt and when you can't avoid it, what to do about it helps protect survivors' income and savings. Tax problems that aren't addressed almost always cost survivors money and undermine economic security. And then secondly, tax benefits, particularly particularly those associated with children, can be worth thousands of dollars each year and can give survivors badly needed funds to meet their essential needs. Now, I think Laura is going to tell us about why family law is so important to um, helping survivors deal with their tax issues and why it's an important tool. Yes, thank you, Jamie. So this is Laura Russell. I'm the citywide director of the Family Domestic Violence Unit, the Legal Aid Society in New York City. And we focus mostly on divorces, both contested and uncontested divorces. So our clients come to us um, with financial issues, which of course always link to tax. Um, two things that are very important to realize from a family law perspective is that pretty much every decision you're going to make in family law has a tax, ish, a tax impact, um, whether it's custody or uh, if the, ch the children are going to have joint custody or how you're going to divide up any of the assets, um, how are you going to file taxes, married, single, head of household. These are all issues that come up in every family law case um, that do need to be dealt with. Um, the other thing for our clients is the tax debt follows you for a very long period of time. And um, not knowing how to handle the tax debt in the divorce um, is, you know, could penalize our clients financially for, for a significant period of time. So it's always good to have a balance and understand the issues uh, that interconnect so that you can at least advise your client as to moving forward, this is what may or may not happen. So, um, And now I'm going to turn it back to Sarah, I believe. To, to Katie, I think I'll Katie, jump from sorry. here. Oh, yes, okay. thanks, Laura. So my name is Katie Von Lindy, and I, uh, most of my experience has been working with survivors of intimate partner violence um, as an economic advocate. And so that is the framework that I come from. And in my, at my perspective, whether you come to this work from a tax perspective or a law perspective or a family law perspective or both, I think it's really important that we center the needs, the values, um, and the concerns of our clients and understand their broad range of risks as the guiding force driving our work and the advocacy that we do. And we know that so many folks that we're working with have a lot of fear, anxiety, and can now feel really helpless when it comes to taxes and the family court system. So to me, that means it's our responsibility to both educate survivors about their options, but also listen to the survivor's broad sense of concerns. So for example, if you're working with a survivor that you know has the right um, legally to, to claim their children on their taxes, um, and that would help them out financially, but the survivor has a whole level of fear based on perhaps um, physical repercussions, but also perhaps just repercussions economically if her, her partner would or his partner would have some negative repercussions. We have to understand why the survivor may choose 
not to ch claim the children? And then how do we continue to support and safety plan with that survivor throughout the process, even when we may have some questions about how they're moving forward with their tax decisions or their family um, law decisions? So to me, I really feel like centering um, advocates' um, information with the survivor's experiences really helps us work together to guide um, and frame tax advocacy and family law advocacy that will be most helpful as we're looking at helping survivors in a very broad sense of what safety means. Hmm. Thanks so much, Katie and all. That's exactly why we're so excited to bring all these minds together. Um, and would love to hear from you all as well, um, joining us, kind of what perspective you're bringing, what questions you have, what you're seeing, so that we can make sure to address those as, as we go. Um, so with, uh, with that as sort of our, our framework and where we're all coming from and grounding this issue, I will hand it back to Amy to really dive into this with us. Okay, so we're going to start talking in detail about why family law lawyers need to know about tax. First of all, your client may actually come in with a tax problem in addition to the family law case, and the tax problem may be related to abuse or some other action of a partner or former partner. Your clients may not know very much about tax, and they may be completely confused about their rights and obligations and the law. Um, in fact, many lawyers are confused about tax and their rights and obligations, so it's not at all surprising that our clients will be as well. And then what happens in the family law case may significantly impact their tax rights, responsibilities, and benefits. Tax problems that your family law clients may have um, can include a number of things. They may be already facing collection action. IRS may be levying, which is essentially the same thing as garnishing, their wages or their bank accounts or their Social Security benefits. Or there may be tax liens on the marital home. Or their spouse may have tax problems which may interfere with the spouse's ability to pay child support to your client. Many parents are confused about tax. It's confusing, it's intimidating, it has its own language, and it may not be the survivor's top priority, even though it has a financial impact. Um, for many survivors, just getting housing finding a safe place to be, having their children, having money may take priority over tax, but tax may become a top priority later on down the line. Um, for so many of us, taking control of your own financial situation, including taxes, can be empowering and an important first step toward financial independence. So if we work together, the tax lawyers and the family lawyers, we can make this possible for survivors as well. Now we have um, on this particular slide some of the many ways that tax problems can be a sign of, of abuse. Um, perhaps a survivor has been forced to sign a tax return or prevented from reviewing a tax return before signing it. Um, your client may have been kept in the dark about household finances um, or joint returns may have been filed without their knowledge. Um, some survivors may have been prevented from filing tax returns when they had either an obligation or a desire to do so. And um, your client may also have been prevented from, from claiming children. Um, these are just a few of the tax problems that um, may at least alert you that there has been um, abuse. Um, we are going to be talking as the webinar progresses about some of the tax problems of individuals. Um, they're not 
they're virtual people, virtual clients that we'll talk about today. And you will see that clients who have been unable to claim their children, um, clients who may be facing an audit because of the action of a former partner, or simply clients who have a tax debt due. And um, you may also see clients who have filed tax returns and the returns are inaccurate, which may cause all kinds of problems for them later on down the road, um, including um, problems related to immigration. Now, typical tax problems that um, may emerge during a family law case um, involve things like refunds. Um, you may have a client who was expecting a refund, um, had filed a joint return with a spouse, and now at least the client's share of the refund has been taken um, by some other creditor to pay the spouse's tax debt. Um, similarly, the client um, may have to file a tax return while the divorce is pending, or at least make a decision whether or not to file a tax return. Um, and these, this is something that's going to come up during, um, during the divorce. Who gets to claim the kids when a return is, um, is going to be filed? Um, this is a, a tremendous issue that has long-term future impact on your individual clients. Um, immigrants who don't qualify for Social Security numbers may need some special tax-related um, attention. And you may find information that is contained in tax returns filed by the parties gets used as evidence in a family law case and um, it may turn out that the, that the information is incorrect. So these are all matters that may come up um, and that we hope we will be able to help you address. Now I'm going to turn things over to Katie. Thank you, Jamie. So before we really jump, Jamie did a great job giving us the background of why this tax information, why this tax work is so important. I think before we jump in with clients to figure out what we're going to do with them, I think it's important for us to think even more about kind of this, this relationship between survivors and, and the taxes that they have. So I can know we can all get into that state of mind when we know that our taxes are due, we're on a deadline, and we got to get them in. We all have those feelings of anxiety and worry. Um, but now imagine that you don't have any idea where the documents are that you need to file because your partner has hidden them for you. Or imagine that you got a letter from the IRS saying you owe $10,000 that you know nothing about. You can just imagine the panic, um, the concern, the worry that you may have um, if, if you're dealing with that case. And that many of our clients actually do have a lot to fear about taxes. That's just beyond our Americans' normal anxiety about tax time. But fear that's related to their visa partner's use of taxes as a form of further economic control. And this also can be compounded even more when clients are also struggling with poverty, um, if they've received misinformation about taxes in the past, if they have a lack of information about taxes, if they are fearful because of their immigration status, or if they come from communities, um, typically communities of color, or under-resourced rural communities where tax preparation services have offered predatory tax refund loans um, that have eaten away on a lot of taxes, re uh, folks' refunds, and just may have a lot of questions and concerns about taxes in general. So if we walk into a meeting with a client and we don't understand their relationship with taxes, we can really miss out on what the survivor wants and needs out of our time together. So trying to determine what our clients want or need is really important, and we have to really ask a combination of open and closed questions to get a baseline feeling about how the survivor feels about taxes and try to help us understand what their current situation might be. So an opening question of something like, how does it feel today for you coming in to talk about your taxes, can be a pretty um, easy way and a, a safer question to to give us a good measure about some of the survivor's fears or concerns they may have. And this also gives us the opportunity to normalize some of the feelings that a survivor may have by if a survivor sh shares with us that they're feeling concerned or they're worried or they don't know, they don't know what to, how to move forward, 
We can normalize that and say, you know, thank you for sharing your concerns, and I want you to know that many people feel the same way and don't know where to begin, but I'm here to help you understand your options in regard to your taxes, and I want to understand your situation so that we can move forward together um, in partnership. So how do we do this? Well, fortunately, we have had some amazing people work on some really great questions about taxes and assessment. And these, um, some of these questions that are on the screen come directly out of um, the guidebook that was created um, by Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. It's the Guidebook on Consumer and Economic Civil Legal Advocacy for Survivors. There are actually two full chapters in this book by two of the, the folks that are here today. Um, Jamie wrote the chapter on taxes and IPV, which is the ninth chapter, and Laura wrote the family law and IPV chapter, which is the tenth chapter. And that, that resource is actually um, t provided for you today. It's an attachment if you want to look at it. I would really encourage you. In addition to some of the great assessment questions that you see here, it also includes um, practice tips, really clear practice tips, and case studies that really put the rich information um, about taxes and family law shared in, in case scenarios. So you can see the, the further questions, as I said earlier, we asked the first general broad assessment question to understand kind of the survivor's um, relationship to taxes, but then we want to get into more specific questions as, do you or your spouse or partner or ex-partner have tax problems? Do we, we want to understand, have you filed tax this year? If so, did you, did you owe anything? Did you get a refund? Um, if, you were, if you were supposed to get a refund and you didn't get it, what, what do you think happened to it? Um, have, you, have you filed taxes in the past? What filing status did you use? Give you just more information about what the situation is right now as the, as the survivor understands it, knowing, full aware that there may be a lot of more information that the survivor actually doesn't have at this time, um, and that that's going to be part of the process of figuring out what the survivor knows and what the survivor doesn't know and how we can work together to safely figure out how we can get some of that information. Laura or Jamie, do you have anything to add? around assessment? Well, I, mean, I, thought, I thought you covered it pretty well. I mean, I think um, with, as with dealing with any client, um, it really takes time to develop a relationship with trust um, or a relationship of trust. And particularly when you're dealing with a survivor, um, you're going to have to, you're going to have to put in the time and, and and listen, and it's interesting that sometimes um, tax problems or other financial problems may be the first clue um, that you have that um, your new client has actually um, suffered abuse. Um, and it may be physical or it may be another type, but um, certainly um, it financial abuse is rampant, and um, it certainly will manifest itself in the tax area. Um, what I am going to talk about now um, I just, I is... Just, uh, Jamie, I just want to yeah. add... Um, oh, go ahead. Something to think about is, unlike a restraining order, which is an immediate need that a lot of our clients go very quickly and get um, as soon as they can, um, tax is something that they, they really think about for a while. Um, you know, it's, it's an issue. They put it out of their minds. They get a notice. They put it out of their minds. So it's going to take clients a while to really come to you and say, I'm ready to, especially as a family law attorney, to say, I have to deal with tax now. Um, it's similar to some of the consumer issues, to say, I have to deal with these credit cards now. They have to be in a place where they're ready to do that. Otherwise, it just becomes overwhelming for them, and they don't, um, they, they just don't process it, and they just can't, they just stop dealing with it. So um, there's not the immediacy uh, in a lot of our clients' minds about tax issues, but, but they are a need, and they are an immediate need, um, and we know that. We just have to you know, keep telling our clients how important that it is. So. That's a great point, Laura. So now we're going to talk about some of the details of the new tax law. But as you can see from the slide, there is some bad news. Tax law is complicated. And unfortunately, there is rarely a quick, easy fix. There is often a fix, but it is not quick, and it is often not easy. And you 
um, and your client may need help from a tax professional. The good news, however, is that tax information is readily available and will provide you with some resources. Um, but I would certainly recommend the IRS website. And there are also free tax clinics in every state that help low-income taxpayers solve their federal tax problems and may be able to consult with you as you and your client are going through um, the divorce or other family court proceeding and are encountering these tax problems. And finally, as we'll talk about in a moment, IRS has its own independent office, the Taxpayer Advocate Service, that is available to help out individuals who are, who are experiencing tax problems. So I'm going to talk about the new law, um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. It um, impacts most taxpayers, including low-income survivors. The changes that we're going to discuss didn't impact the 2017 tax returns that were filed in 2018, but they are going to impact the 2018 returns, which will get filed in 2019. Decisions made today in family law cases will impact what parents can do on this year's returns and, in, and on those going forward. And the new changes impact tax year 2018 through 2025, those tax year returns. What happens after tax year 2025? We don't actually know. Um, and that, of course, is a little bit scary because a child born last year in 2017 will turn eight in 2025. And so a lot of the decisions that are made are going to um, impact parents and their ability to claim children um, well past 2025, and we don't know what the tax rules are going to be after that. Um, and unfortunately, because the changes are so new, we can't be 100% sure how language and divorce decrees this year are going to be read by IRS over the next couple of years. We really haven't seen the new forms or the publications yet, and so it's a little unclear um, how things are going to work out. Um, now, I'm going to give you a summary of the major tax changes that impact divorcing parents. Please don't panic if you don't understand this right now. Um, my hope is that we will, you will understand it by the end of the webinar. Um, the first thing is that personal and dependent exemptions, which are used to reduce your income. Um, in fact, for those of you who filed tax returns in 2017, you might know that each exemption is worth, was worth $4,050. Um, that amount is being reduced to zero. However, it still matters a lot whether a person qualifies as a dependent, even though um, be qualifying as a dependent won't reduce income by any amount. So that's one thing that's changed, and we'll talk quite a bit more about that. The standard deduction, um, which is also deduction from income and which is based on filing status has almost doubled for tax year 2018 and all the way through 2025. So for example, if a single person used to be able to use a standard deduction of 6,350 for tax year 2017, it's almost doubled. It's now $12,000 for 2018. Um, and Similarly, head of household, married filing jointly, standard deductions have also gone up. Um, the filing status rules, which filing status you can use, those have not changed under the new tax law. The child tax credit has doubled, and the refundable portion of the child tax credit has increased. And as I say, please don't panic. If you don't understand what those things are, we will explain them to you as, as, as we go through this webinar. Um, Finally, um, starting um, in two th with 2018 returns, there's going to be a new child tax credit um, for dependents who are age 17 and over. Starting in 2019, 
alimony is not any longer a deduction to those who pay and not income to those who receive it um, for decrees that are signed starting in 2019. And for the most part, the prior al the existing alimony rules apply to divorce decrees that were signed prior to 2019. So if alimony is an issue um, in one of your cases, you might consider that the decisions made about alimony for a decree signed this year are going to be uh, the implications, tax implications, will be different than if the decree is signed um, after December 31st, 2018. And this is Laura. I just want to add with regard to alimony for the family law practitioner. Um, some states have actually kept the old rules, so that so they have passed tax laws that say that alimony is still deductible um, moving forward. Um, so you definitely need to check with your state on that issue. Um, and also some stipulations of settlement, if you modify alimony post December 31st of 2018, then the modification could make it non-taxable. And sometimes your stipulation of settlement brings that into question and says if suddenly alimony becomes non-taxable, we have to look at it differently or adjust the numbers. So, um, so something also to think about is if they're coming in to modify the alimony, um, you want to read that entire settlement agreement and see if it, if it mentions anything about how deductibility affects alimony. So, so just to be clear that you um, completely understand, the new tax law only impacts how IRS is going to treat alimony starting in 2019. States are still free to have their own rules on whether alimony will be subject to state tax or counted as income on state tax returns by the people who receive them. Um, and so some states follow the IRS rules and some states don't. So you're going to have to know um, what your state actually does. Okay, so. This is Sarah, sorry, just to interject really quick before we dive into um, some of these case scenarios. If folks have questions thus far about screening and assessment, um, some of the tax laws, um, can you type them in the chat for us? That way Jamie and Laura can, um, they kind of know what's on your mind and can make sure to uh, address them. So um, let us know how you're reacting and, and what questions are coming up thus far. Thanks. OK. I just want to make sure we're on the correct slide here. Let's see. This should be slide number 28. There we go. OK, so next slide. Here's what we are going to be covering. Um, I'm not going to read through this particular slide because we are going to get to these things, but we do have some case studies to illustrate um, some of the different tax issues. Okay, so filing status and why it matters. Filing status is going to come up in divorce cases in a range of different ways. Um, some divorcing spouses may need to file tax returns while the divorce is pending. We have on occasion seen judges um, order divorcing spouses to file joint tax returns. So we will talk about that. Um, there may be prior year's tax returns that need to be filed. If you're representing um, someone in a divorce case this spring, you may discover that no tax returns have been filed for the last couple of years. Um, so in addition to the current year's return, you're going to have to be thinking about those prior year's returns. Um, the filing status that a survivor uses impacts which child-related tax benefits are available, how much tax is owed, or how much of a refund is due. And choosing the wrong filing status can result 
in an audit, owing more tax, or getting a smaller refund than if the correct filing status had been chosen. Now here are the um, available filing status choices. Um, most people are familiar with the first four, um, but there is also a qualifying widower, widower with dependent child, which is available for certain individuals. This slide shows what the standard deduction is. Um, the standard deduction reduces the amount of income that is subject to tax for each filing status. So for example, if you're filing a 2018 return using the single filing status and your income was $18,000, the standard deduction would lower your taxable income to $6,000. And then, of course, there may be other deductions that lower it further. But that's what um, a standard deduction does. Now, one of the things that um, has come up many times over the years is that individuals often don't know, married people often don't know, that they do not have to file joint tax returns. Married people are not required to file joint tax returns. They can't be forced to file joint tax returns. And they may choose between one of the three filing statuses listed on the slide. Married filing jointly, married filing separately, or head of household, assuming that they meet specific legal requirements to choose head of household. Married people can choose married filing jointly, regardless of whether they live together. They can choose to file separately, again, regardless of whether they live together. However, if um, they are going to file head of household, there are special rules about living apart that they will have to meet. Marital status for filing purposes is based on your marital status on the very last day of the tax year. So for example, if you were divorced on December 30th, 2017, then on December 31st, 2017, you were single. And so you could file a 2017 return using the filing status single. However, if you weren't divorced until January 1st, 2018, then your status on the 31st of December was still married, and you would have to choose between married filing jointly, married filing separately, or and if you qualified for head of household. Now, you'll see a reference there to Elizabeth and Jane. Um, they are some virtual clients that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but I am now... To so I just, uh, is Laura again, I just want to yes. jump in and say that predatory tax preparers tend to completely um, do the, ma the filing status is wrong. I don't know how else to say it. They will um, choose a filing status that will get their, the person standing in front of them the most money back, which is not always the filing status they should have. So um, that's something to think about if your client has gone to one of those predatory agencies, especially the agencies that have rapid refund loans um, that are looking to just take as much client's money as they can. Um, they, they tend to skew these filing statuses um, and, and have people file in statuses they shouldn't be. I think Laura's going to tell us about our first um, yes. virtual client. So we're going to talk about Elizabeth. So Elizabeth is getting divorced from Fiona, and they have two children together. Um, the children live with Elizabeth but stay with Fiona on the weekends. Um, everything is open for discussion or dispute, custody, child support, alimony, division of bank accounts, and everything um, within the divorce. Elizabeth does not have immigration status or a valid Social Security number. Um, but she does speak English. 
and since separating, she started working but hasn't yet filed tax returns. She has no idea what returns have been filed in the past, and Fiona has told her that she intends to claim the children on her taxes from now on. So, what are the key aspects to Elizabeth's case? Well, the questions that the family law practitioner will have is, how can Elizabeth file a tax return without a valid social security number? Should she be filing a tax return? What are the benefits? Um, what should she be deciding whether, when either letting Fiona claim the children? Can she even let Fiona claim the children? Um, should she be claiming the children? Who technically under the tax code can claim the children? Um, and is there any possibility of switching that's the uh, claiming of the children back and forth or um, over different years? So these are a lot of issues that our clients come to us with um, as the family law practitioner and um, that uh, we see in a lot of cases. So, um, so the big question, of course, is can Elizabeth even file a tax return? She doesn't have a Social Security number. Um, and she doesn't qualify to get a Social Security number. But she can get what we call an ITIN, which is an Individual Taxpayer Identification Number. And it's issued by the IRS. And it's issued for a variety of reasons. But for our clients who don't have immigration status, it basically allows them to comply with the tax laws. Because um, by complying with the tax laws, it makes their immigration process go smoothly. Um, if they do get have, or have the ability to get immigration status in the future, you want to make sure that they have complied with the tax laws um, during the entire time that they were in the United States. And we have many immigration clients that we actually get ITINs and file back returns for uh, because of that issue. Um, the uh, the ITIN does not authorize the immigrant to work, so we're not talking about a work authorization. Um, it is available for dependents and spouses, and it is, a, it is simple to apply for. It, you just have to attach an IRS form, W-7, which you can get right off the website. Um, the IRS has all their forms on the website with proof of identity and foreign status documents, which is usually a passport. Um, you can also apply in person at an IRS agent, but at, at most I, some IRS offices do have this. Um, so you don't have to mail in your, your document. So um, most major cities will have IRS offices that have certifying acceptance agents. Um, that's something to just check. But you definitely want to tell Elizabeth that not only can she file a tax return, but with immigration she should be filing some kind of tax return, assuming her tax liability is there. Um, and that's a literally a question you have with three people, your immigration attorney, your uh, tax attorney, and the family law attorney. Um, and the, there, was a, there is a question in the box about the risks for an undocumented client applying for an ITIN. Um, at this point in time, the IRS is not sharing information with ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And on your immigration forms when you apply for status, you are required to say that you have filed tax returns if you are required to have filed tax returns. So it is actually the risk is not filing taxes could make her immigration case much more complicated or even ineligible for immigration relief or an adjustment of status. Um, what if Elizabeth was working under another person's Social Security number? So that brings up a whole array of issues. Um, first of all, that is illegal. Second of all, um, filing taxes on another person's Social Security number is committing fraud with the IRS. Jamie could probably speak more about that. Um, and also, um, there are a whole other issues she could get sued under this person's name, um, she's the, the taxes that are going in, the other person can claim identity theft, um, and I would strongly tell my clients if they are doing that to cease immediately because um, that might even be a permanent bar to getting any kind of immigration relief in the future. 
Um, since we have the question, even though we don't have a slide that directly addresses it, I, I will um, at least attempt to add a little bit more to um, Laura's answer to the question. Um, despite the fact that it is a really bad idea um, to be using another person's social security number to work, um, many individuals feel that they have no choice um, but to do that. So it's actually a fairly common practice. Um, you're required to file um, a tax return if you have income above a certain level. And that would include income that you have obtained using another person's social security number. It, it's still taxable income um, and to the person who earned it. And so um, an individual with an ITIN can file a tax return and report that income even though it was earned under the other person's social security number. Um, and um, if, in fact, many of the um, individuals who are in Elizabeth's situation and are working using another person's social security number um, actually receive um, W-2 forms um, with that other name and social security number, but they can still uh, attach those um, to their own tax returns and report that income um, to the IRS and pay whatever tax is due on that. And IRS will process those returns, although sometimes it's necessary to get help from the Taxpayer Advocate Service. Um, it's certainly a, it's a very tricky situation, and, and it's certainly not anything that you want your clients to be doing. They need to understand the, the legal implications and the dangers associated with continuing to do that. OK, so now we're going to talk about um, the options available to um, a survivor who is married um, for filing a tax return, filing jointly, separately, um, or as head of household. Um, this slide gives you the advantages of married filing jointly over married filing separately. Um, and keep in mind, spouses married on the last, still married on the last day of the tax year cannot use the single filing status. Um, married filing jointly has a higher standard deduction. Um, there are a range of benefits that are not available to a taxpayer who uses married filing separately. Um, for example, um, if you use the, if you file married filing separately, you would not be entitled to the earned income tax credit, um, student loan interest, and other deductions and credits related to education, child and dependent care credit, um, and. Um, except for some um, survivors, uh, the premium tax credit. So those are not available to taxpayers who use the filing status married filing separately. In addition, if um, your client is receiving Social Security income um, and lived with their spouse at some point during the tax year, um, they are going to have all of their Social Security subject to taxation if they filed married filing separately, whereas taxpayers who are married and filed jointly can exclude um, much more Social Security income from being taxed. And actually, married filing separately, 80% of it is subject to, to tax, so a little bit is excluded, but more is excluded if you're filing married filing jointly. And just in general, not always, but in general, um, you will end up paying less tax or be due a bigger refund if you're filing if you're married and you're filing married filing jointly. However, there are risks to married filing jointly. Um, and some of the questions that we've seen um, posed in advance of this webinar make it quite clear that that many of you are well aware of what these risks are. When spouses file a joint return, both spouses are responsible for whatever tax is shown on the tax return or whatever tax may be due um, 
after IRS identifies errors in the return. Both spouses are liable for the entire amount due, even if only one spouse had income, or even if one spouse made mistakes that led to tax being due, both spouses are jointly and severally liable. And IRS can pursue either one or both of the spouses to collect the tax. Um, and I, over the years, I've talked to many survivors who said, you know, this wasn't my mistake. This was my spouse's mistake. My spouse had all the income. I don't understand why I'm the one who is being chased by IRS to pay the tax. And it's because that's what the law um, permits. Um, the other, another potential disadvantage or risk to married filing jointly is if you file um, a joint return and one spouse has a debt, perhaps an unpaid student loan, um, the entire refund, including the other spouse's share of it, can be taken to apply to one spouse's sole debt. Fortunately, that's something that can be prevented or there's an easy fix for, and we'll cover that before the webinar ends. I, um, I just and want to also add as a risk in family law that um, the a tax return that both parties have jointly filed is therefore going to be evidence as to income. And both parties have agreed with the IRS that this is the income of the other party. And so that tax return is going to go in as income for, cust for child support, for alimony, for distribution of assets and property. So, um, and not just the income, but also if property switched hands and it was and it was supposed to be on the tax re return and it wasn't, um, you know, and your client's saying, but wait, we sold something and it's not there, um, the judge is going to say, well, you know, you didn't tell the IRS, so this, this is going to come in as evidence. So your clients do need to realize that what they signed two years ago is now going to be used against them in the divorce if there was, if they believe there was any kind of underreporting going on. Finally, if although we're not going to talk about it during this webinar, um, some survivors may be able to obtain something called innocent spouse relief from a joint tax debt. Um, and, and so that help, may help mitigate some of the risks to married filing jointly. However, um, obtaining innocent spouse relief is not automatic, and um, it is best sought with an experienced tax attorney or other tax professional. OK, so um, just a few things to keep in mind. Um, one advantage to married filing separately is the taxpayer who uses it is only responsible for their own tax debt and won't have to deal with refunds being taken to apply to um, a spouse's debts. Um, the other thing is, um, if you file married filing jointly and want to change your mind and file an amended return um, using married filing separately, you have only a very short time until the due date of the return, which is usually around April 15th, to switch from married filing jointly to married filing separately. Um, you have a much longer period of time to amend um, and file a joint return after originally filing a separate return, generally three years um, from the return's due dates. And then, you know, there are other concerns, but these are, are the ones that we're going to be able to address today. So, um, how do you know if... Um, if it's a bad idea to um, file a return with your spouse. I mean, what are some of the things that, that you ought to be considering? Um, we've listed some of the considerations. And um, if, if your spouse is secretive, if you, the spouse is abusive, um, if the spouse controls um, household financial decisions, then um, those are those are big red flags, um, and really ought to take seriously the idea of not filing a joint return with the spouse. 
Um, but if your client has access to household bank records and knows how much the spouse earns, um, and the spouse keeps good records, um, those are are things that are, are good signs, and, and, and they're not red flags, and they might provide some reassurance about um, married filing jointly. But these are the kinds of questions that you can ask your client to help um, make a decision about whether or not to file a joint return with their spouse. Now, head of household has benefits um, when compared to either married filing jointly or married filing separately. Um, if, if you qualify and you choose to file as head of household, you're only responsible for your own tax debt and only your own errors. Um, so you avoid this problem of joint and several liability. It's got the higher standard deduction, $18,000 uh, for next year uh, than married filing separately, where your standard deduction is only $12,000. Um, and um, of particular importance to, for low to moderate income taxpayers, if you are eligible, you can claim the earned income tax credit when you file head of household. You cannot claim it even if you would otherwise be eligible if you file um, using the status married filing separately. However, um, unlike married filing separately and married filing jointly, which is something you can just choose, to use head of household, you have to meet um, the following requirements. Um, you have to have provided the principal um, place of abode, living place for at least one dependent, and that's for more than half the tax year if we're talking about kids. Um, you have to have provided more than um, half the annual support for the household. So if you are living in a household that someone else is providing for you and they're paying the expenses, you wouldn't qualify for head of household. You have to be considered unmarried, and you'll note that on the slide that term is in quotes because um, it includes people who lived apart from their spouses for at least the last six months of the tax year. So if you're dealing with a um, client who separated from their spouse in August, um, that individual is not going to qualify um, to file as head of household for that particular tax year because they were not considered unmarried. But if they um, are still married yet separated from their spouse in April of the tax year in question, then they would meet the criteria of unmarried. And then there's a couple of references and resources on the slide that, um, that can give you more information about head of household. OK, so if you're taxpayers married to and lived with their spouse at any time during the last six months of the year, didn't provide the main home for a qualifying person for more than half the year, or didn't pay more than half the cost of keeping up the home for the tax year, then they're not going to be able to use the head of household filing status. And if they're still married at the end of the tax year, then they're going to have to choose between married filing jointly and married filing separately. OK, so we're going to talk about when a tax return in a survivor's name um, is um, or um, may not be valid. And this typically comes up when I'm talking to a survivor about a tax debt for a particular year. And the person says something like, well, I didn't file a tax return that year. Or I didn't agree to file a joint tax return that year. Year, then you know you begin to get into the question of whether a particular return is a valid return. So, returns that are signed under duress um, are not valid returns, and um, by that we're talking about returns where the survivor was 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 forced to sign it. Um, a forged signature, um, if it's a paper return or a PIN number, also 
doesn't necessarily give rise to a valid tax return. Um, but IRS will um, look at a return or a claim that a return is invalid and say, well, was there tacit consent? Um, is, is this a situation where a married couple have filed year after year after year together and there doesn't appear to have ever been an objection and maybe the person who's now claiming it's invalid had given tax information to the spouse to use? Um, and so there may be situations where the client you're dealing with says, well, I didn't agree to file this return, but IRS finds that there was tacit consent to the filing of a joint return. Um, the good thing is that IRS can be persuaded that even where there's been a past history of spouses filing together, things may have changed. And the particular return you're dealing with now, the most recent return, may not be valid because there was no consent or agreement to file um, a return. A taxpayer who's going to contest the validity of a return is definitely going to need experienced tax help. Um, and again, we will let you know where one might be able to get experienced tax help. The other thing is that, and Laura actually alluded to this earlier, um, family court judges will consider a return to be valid evidence of the information that's contained in the return, um, even if one of the pers one of one of the people whose whose return it is says, "Well, it's it, it's not valid." Um, it's going to be up to IRS to say whether or not a return is valid. So family court's usually not going to work as a venue to litigate um, the validity of a tax return. That's something that you're going to have to take up with, with IRS. OK, so I uh, mentioned duress and coercion. And on this slide, there um, it, we've listed some of the most common indications of coercion. OK, so um, what if a um, return that was filed as a married filing jointly return is invalid? Well, um, it is often a very good idea for survivors to file their own returns either married filing separately or head of household if they qualify. Um, and they may need help from the Taxpayer Advocate Service, which I'll discuss a little later, to get the return process. But um, filing their own return can help um, support a contention that a married filing jointly return is not valid. Um, IRS has identity theft procedures, which may be a way to get um, a survivor off the married filing jointly return. And IRS's innocent spouse unit also um, works allegations of duress and forged signature, those issues. So someone who um, whose name appears on a married filing jointly return and is now being pursued um, or has a tax debt arising from that return, may be seeking innocent spouse and can raise with the innocent spouse unit um, as sort of an initial contention, this is not a valid return. You know, this, was a, this is a forged signature. So, so that's, that is an option as well. Um, I believe that Laura is now going to talk about our next case scenario. Yes, I just want to, before I discuss the case scenario, I just want to also add that the timing of when to tell the IRS that it is not a valid return um, is something if the parties are in the midst of a divorce or haven't been divorced that you should definitely discuss with the divorce lawyer as well as the client because any tax debt that will be owed during the marriage, a, um, a family law judge could decide that that is a marital debt even if it was a, the return was fraudulently filed in the first place. So, um, so definitely something to remember is that if you are going to file anything with the IRS, you need to involve the family law attorney so that um, 
you can um, make sure that it's done at the most opportune time for our clients. So, um, and now we're going to move on to the case scenario. So, so Rebecca's story. Um, so Rebecca has two children with Maxim. They are not married. Um, there is a restraining order, and she has physical custody of the children, but there's no legal custody order. Maxim barely sees the children. Rebecca tried to file her tax return electronically in 2017, but it was rejected. And so she mailed it, which is a mechanism that a lot of our clients do, that if their tax return is rejected electronically, they can just file it by mail. And, and instead of receiving her expected refund, she receives a notice from the IRS that most of her refund has been frozen, and she has 30 days to send proof of her relationship and residence of the children. So, um, so what are Rebecca's questions? Well, the first question is why is this happening? Why is she getting something from the IRS saying that she has to prove that the children are hers, that they live with her? Um, what does she need to do? So this is a situation where Rebecca is going to need to gather a lot of evidence to show that she has physical custody of the children. And this has to do with what Jamie's going to talk about, which is claiming the children. So the issue is, can Rebecca show that the children live with her, that they spend nights with her, more nights with her than they do with Maxim? Um, how long will it take to get this problem resolved, and where can Rebecca get help? Well, this is something that um, someone in a low-income taxpayer clinic can help with. This is something that the tax advocate payer service can help with. This is something that her family law attorney can help with, too, because as a family law attorney, we need to, we need to talk about custody in almost all our cases. So we need to know what proves who physically has the child, bathes the child, takes care of the child, brings the child to school, where is the child registered. Um, so all these forms, you know, the registration for school, the registration at the doctors, Medicaid cards, public benefits, all these forms are going to help Rebecca show that she's the one who should rightfully be claiming the children. Um, will Maxim have access to any information? Maxim will have access to some information because they're going to, they're going to audit him as well. And is there anything that Rebecca can do to prevent this happening in the future? The best thing that I tell my clients, and Jamie probably has other advice too, would be to file as soon as you can. If you are the first to file, then the other side will get audited more than you. So um, I'm going to now turn it over to Jamie, who's going to talk about claiming the children. Jamie? I think you're on mute. I am on mute, but not anymore. OK, the rules for claiming kids are lengthy, um, and they're complicated. And so we're just going to kind of just touch on the issues and sketch out those that are most common when parents are, are separating and divorcing. Um, we've listed on this. Uh, slide the main tax benefits that are related to kids. And we talked about exemptions at the beginning. Um, and the rules are different for tax returns filed for 2017 and earlier. And the rules that will be going into effect for tax returns that we file in 2018. Um, the probably main thing that you need to remember is you need to know whether you can claim a child as an exemption, as a dependent exemption, but you're not going to actually subtract any um, income from your income, any amount from your income, if you can claim the child as an exemption. OK. Um, for 2018 through tax year 2025, um, again, the, we're, the exemption amount is zero. 
but whether or not a child com qualifies as a dependent is extremely important because only a child who qualifies as a dependent can be claimed for the child tax credit. Okay, so we're going to have to figure out whether these children claim can qualify as dependents. And again, this is very, very, very cursory coverage. Um, a, to be a qualifying child, a child has to meet five tests to be claimed. A relationship test, an age test, a residence test, a support test, and a joint return test. And those tests are laid out in the slides. So um, when it comes time to talk to your client about whether or not the client wants to be able to claim a child as a dependent, you're going to have to go through with the client and to help the client determine whether or not a particular child can be claimed um, as, as a dependent. In the past, a child who was 17 years of age or older did not qualify for the child tax credit. However, um, the new tax law now allows children who are age 17 or over to qualify for um, the child tax credit. And so you need to know whether your kids who are 17 and over will qualify as dependents as well. Now, when it comes to who can claim the children, who gets to claim the exemption for a child, um, when parents are divorced and separated, it's the custodial parent who generally claims the exemption, although we'll talk about some exceptions in a moment. However, regardless of what a court decree says, IRS considers the custodial parent as the one with whom the child spent the most number of nights during the tax year. Now, often, the person who is listed in the court decree as the custodial parent is also the one with whom the child spent the most number of nights during the tax year. But IRS rules control what IRS does, and, and that's how IRS determines whether or not a parent is a custodial parent. So for example, if a child lived in one parent's home during the week, Monday through Friday, and spent um, Saturday and Sunday with the other parent, then the during the week parent is going to be considered the custodial parent by the IRS. And in that situation, probably going to be considered the custodial parent by um, the court as well. Now, obviously, in a lot of divorce cases, we have joint custody being awarded um, to the parents. And that terminology, joint custody, doesn't really mean anything to IRS for the purposes of who gets to claim the exemption. The custodial parent gets to claim the exemption. And again, that's the person with whom the child spent the most number of nights during, um, during the tax year. And just to add, now, there's, sorry, there's joint legal custody, joint physical custody, joint residential custody. I know there's a million ways to name this. What we're talking about here is residential custody. And when you're dealing with a situation where there's actually a split or shared parenting time, um, you need to count those nights and tell your client, you know, you have one night less, and therefore they're going to claim the children, not you. And when you're negotiating, you need to remember that um, that breaking point, that that is an issue in negotiations when you're setting an actual shared physical parenting time. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. 
Now, when a child spends an equal number of nights with each parent in, during the tax year, um, and that may be 365 nights because the parents were not separated during the tax year, then it's the parent with the highest adjusted gross income who's considered by IRS to have been the custodial parent for that year. Um, if IRS um, audits a tax return and the issue is claiming the child, um, the parent may have to be able to document where the child lived um, or where the child spent nights if, if there's a di dispute about that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that in just a moment. So a court can decide um, which parent gets to claim the child as a dependent, but IRS is still not bound by that decision. IRS is bound by its own rules, although in many cases, the child spends the most nights with the parent designated in the court decision as the custodial parent, but not always. OK, this slide explains how claiming a child as a dependent impacts a parent's responsibilities and benefits under the Affordable Care Act. We're not going to talk about it. Um, so non-custodial parents can sometimes claim the children. Non-custodial parent can claim the child as a dependent if the custodial parent releases the exemption in writing. And this usually happens as the result of a divorce decree that says the non-custodial parent may claim the child as a dependent. Um, being able to claim the child as a dependent also means being able to claim the child tax credit. Um, but it does not mean that the non-custodial parent can claim the earned income tax credit. Even if the custodial parent releases the exemption and the non-custodial parent claims the child and the child tax credit, if the custodial parent is otherwise eligible for the earned income tax cred credit, the, the custodial parent can claim it even though the custodial parent is not claiming the child as an exemption. Now, for the non-custodial parent to be successful in claiming the child as a dependent on their tax return, the non-custodial parent has to have IRS Form 8332 or some other writing that contains the same information signed by the custodial parent, and then the non-custodial parent has to attach that to the non-custodial parent's tax return. OK. Now, there are cases where divorces occurred before 2009. Um, probably we're not going to be seeing very many of those now. Um, but in those cases, in certain situations, the non-custodial parent, instead of getting the Form 8332, can attach pages from the court order. That Form 8332, which is a really simple tax form, one of the few really simple tax forms, um, can be revoked by the custodial parent um, using another Form 8332. Um, it has to be sent to the non-custodial parent and then attached. This is the revocation to the custodial parent's um, tax form so that IRS knows that the custodial parent has revoked the release. Um, the, the release of the, of the exemption can be for one year. It can be for all future years. It can be for odd or even years. Um, some children the exemption can be released for, but not all of the children. Um, it's just a matter of how the custodial parent um, wants to or has been ordered by the family court to release exemptions. Now, in situations where, um, for example, the divorce decree says that the non-custodial parent may claim the child as a dependent, and the custodial parent won't release the, the, the exemption and 
the custodial parent instead claims the child in um, contrary to the divorce decree, in those situations, IRS will not help out the non-custodial parent. Um, the family court might, but IRS won't. However, in situations where a non-custodial parent wrongfully claims a child, then the custodial parent can file their own return and leave it to IRS to figure out who can rightfully um, claim the child. And a practice point with this is I do not have my clients sign a multi-year form. I have them sign it every year at the end of the year. Um, so that if something does happen or something does change, there's not this form floating around um, that they may forget to file a revocation that says that the other side's supposed to claim. So I tell my my client that they're going to give them this form if they can if they have to every year and not in a multi-year situation. That that's a great pointer, um, and we have a few others also. Um, I recommend that you try to avoid custody orders that split physical custody 50-50. Because if you do that, um, if neither parent is going to have the child greater than half the year, neither parent will be able to qualify for the earned income tax credit. And that can be worth a lot. So even in a joint custody situation, a physical custody can still be di um, divided 48% versus 52% of the year or, so, or something like that. Um, as one of our um, um, participants noted in a chat, it's really important for your client to keep track of the nights that the children are actually there. And this can be done on a, on a calendar. Um, I encourage clients save envelopes and documents that reflect where children are living at, you know, at your client's address. And if your client's a custodial parent, as defined by IRS, make sure documents reflect that the children live with your client. You know, put your kids on the lease. Um, make sure school records reflect where the child is actually living, and welfare department records, and medical records, and, and that sort of thing. And then another tip is that, um, you know, the court decree can condition the non-custodial parent claiming the child on being um, paid up in full on, you know, child-related expenses, child support, you know, that sort of thing. Um, if if the non-custodial parent, only if the non-custodial parent is caught up on these expenses, can the non-custodial parent claim the the child as an exemption, and that will enable the custodial parent to claim the child if the non-custodial parent is not caught up. Okay. And what I what I do is I put that specifically in the stipulation of settlement in uh, in um, either a global settlement or in a child support or custody settlement that the the form will be provided assuming that the non custodial parent is fully paid on all expenses and child support and other related child costs. So now Laura will tell us about our next client. So, Jane. so now we're going to move on to Jane. So Jane is married to Edward, but they've been separated since May of 2017. They have two children, but Jane lives in the marital residence with the two children. Edward pays the expenses. In the past, they filed joint returns, but Jane, Jane has never been permitted to see them because Edward has been secretive. Um, and Jane has no information about household finances and she has no income other than the allowance that Edward gives her, um, no access to anything. Edward is demanding that Jane file a joint 2017 tax return since they are still legally married, um, and he wants to keep the entire refund that, that they will receive. If she refuses, he will file on his own and claim the children on his return, not allowing her to claim the children. So this is a very typical story. We see this a lot. The client has no idea of what's going on with the finances. And um, the, um, the client really doesn't know what, what the income or expenses are, but everything is being paid. She gets an allowance, which is usually meager, and usually they ha she has to account for every penny she spends. Um, but uh, you know, at this point, at least he is still paying 
the marital residence expenses, um, which is more than we could say for a lot of our clients' spouses. So some of Jane's questions, what are the pros and cons of filing a joint return? Um, is there a remedy if they owe taxes and they filed a joint return because Edward is not um, accurately reporting his income to the IRS? Um, if he refuses to file a joint return, can Edward just claim the children on his own? Um, and even though she has no income, should she file her own tax return? Um, how can she find out if tax might be owed? Um, how can she find out anything about what Edward is wanting to file um, with regard to taxes? And what if she's going to owe taxes if she decides to file on her own? So, um, so. Uh, we talked a lot about which of about claiming the children. So, which of these, which of all of our clients can claim the children? So, I'm going to start with Jane because we just talked about Jane. So, we said in the scenario that Jane and Edward separated in May of 2017. So that means that for more than six months they have been separated, and the children have been living with Jane. So, um, she can claim the children. That is her right. She may not want to because with no income, there's no financial benefit for her to claim the children. Um, but she does have a right to claim the children. With Rebecca, um, Rebecca is considered the custodial parent because the children have spent more nights with her. Again, the IRS looks at the nights the, the children spend together uh, with the parents. Um, and Elizabeth, we don't. It's possible because the children have probably spent more nights with her, but they may have actually spent the same amount of time with both parents because they, they didn't separate till after the tax year ended. So then you're going to look at tiebreaker rules, and the, the tiebreaker rule is, is mostly and more importantly who has more income. And the, the IRS basically says if you have more income, you're spending more money on your children. I can't say that's right or wrong. I'm just telling you what the IRS thinks. Um, so so this, is a, this is a big issue for a lot of our clients, who gets to claim the children and why and should they. Um, and uh, it's, it's definitely something that, that we need to talk about with every client because as we see with Jane, yes, she has the right to claim the children, but that may not be the best scenario for the family. So. Um, and now we're going to move on to uh, Jamie with tax credits. So. Thank you, Laura. OK, we're going to move through these next 10 slides quickly so we'll have time for questions. Um, under the new tax law, this is where being able to claim a child as a dependent provides the tax benefit to the taxpayer. And if you remember nothing else, the child tax credit reduces the amount of tax owed. Once the amount of tax owed is reduced to zero, if there's some credit left over, some or all of it can be paid to the parent claiming the child as part of the refund. And the custodial parent gets to claim it unless the custodial parent has released the dependency exemption to the non-custodial parent. The Earned Income Tax Credit is the largest cash anti-poverty program in the United States for working people with children. Um, it can be worth thousands of dollars to a qualifying taxpayer. And we have listed the rules on the slide for who it is who will qualify to be um, eligible for the Earned Income Tax Credit. Now. Um, if both parents appear to qualify for the earned income tax credit, the IRS has tiebreaker rules. Um, specifically, if both uh, qualify, the parent with whom the child spent the longer time during the tax year gets it. And if that's equal, then the parent with the highest um, AGI, adjusted gross income. 
um, which of our clients qualify for the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. Well, Elizabeth has the children during the week, so she should qualify as the custodial parent and be able to claim the child tax credit, but she can't claim the earned income tax credit because she doesn't have a social security number. She is not a citizen or a permanent resident. Rebecca, if otherwise eligible for them, should be able to qualify for both the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. And Jane can qualify for the child tax credit, but it probably won't help her as she has no tax to reduce since she has no income during the tax year um, and doesn't qualify for the refundable portion of the child tax credit because she has no income and can't qualify for the earned income tax credit because she has no earnings during the tax year. And then finally, when one parent files a return claiming the earned income, uh, claiming the children before the other files, the second parent is not going to be able to file a return electronically claiming the same children, but can and should still file a paper return claiming those children. It takes a lot longer to process a paper return, but a survivor in this situation um, has to file a paper return or is not going to be able to remedy the problem. And then it's up to IRS to figure out which parent gets to claim the children. And it may audit one or both returns in order to figure that out. So we have a number of slides that we're not going to be able to review, um, but they do contain important information about the earned income tax credit. And so I encourage you to review them on your own. You can always email me or contact other tax practitioners you know if you um, if you have questions. Okay, these tips um, are useful really only to clients sort of going forward. Um, it's too late to tell a client to keep a contemporaneous calendar for last year, but they are otherwise good tips and make sure you discuss them with your clients so they can ensure that they get the kid-related benefits they're entitled to receive even if, um, even if they end up having their tax return audited and have to establish that they're entitled to receive the tax benefits. So um, this slide explains what happened to Rebecca's audit. Um, the other or, which led to her audit. Um, the other parent filed first, and her best bet to deal with the audit is to get professional tax help so that she is certain that she is going to be able to um, keep the uh, claim the children that she did claim on her return. Okay, and then just a few reminders about custodial versus non-custodial parents. So I think this brings us to our time for questions. Yes, this is Sarah. I'd invite Laura, Katie, as well as Erica to unmute and, and join us. If anyone in the, um, any of our attendees have any questions or if you need more talking out of questions you've offered in the chat, please let us know. What's on your mind? I would just underscore as folks are sort of pulling their um, thoughts together, because I know sometimes it takes a little while. Um, you know, some of the themes that arose during this were um, that, that, that it sounded like folks were curious about related to survivor-centered economic advocacy um, around some really complex um, economic choices. In one instance, folks were talking about immigration and um, social security numbers and how to counsel clients with those um, challenging um, circumstances. Um, there have been a lot of questions about the connection between um, divorce decrees and, and tax relief. And so if there are more particular questions there in terms of what family lawyers can do um, to most beneficially set up clients um, in the tax space, we welcome those. Um, so lots of, and, and I'm sure many, many other areas. So if folks are um, have questions to share with us, it looks like there may be one right here. 
Um, so Katina says, is the Form 8832 required for NCP to claim the child, non-custodial parent, um, or would the wording of a decree be enough? Uh, this is Jamie, and I can answer that question. Um, for divorces finalized starting in 2009, the decree is not going to be um, sufficient. Um, if the custodial parent signs either Form 8332 or writes out a statement that contains the same information that is required by the form, then the non-custodial parent can attach that. But without either the form itself or a statement that contains the same information, um, the, the non-custodial parent will not be able to just attach the decree. Great. Um, we have another um, person, Sarah, asking us, what about for divorces finalized years ago but with the child stuff amended now? Well, this is Jamie again. Um, so the, um, you know, divorces that were finalized years ago um, and set out who um, can claim the children, um, the, the rules for claiming children really aren't changed by the new tax law. Um, and filing status isn't changed by the new tax law. What's really changed by the new tax law is um, sort of the mechanics of filling out the tax return and also um, the financial impact of being able to claim a child. And it, the financial impact is going to be different for every family based on the number of children that they have. But if, 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 a, if for example, a divorce decree from seven years ago um, grants the non-custodial parent the right to claim um, a child in odd years, um, there's nothing that's happened in the new tax law that will that will change that. Thank you. Um, Talia asks, where should low income clients go for representation if they are being audited? Oh, I, I'd like to answer that one for sure. <laughs> um, go for it. So, um, so IRS funds low or partially funds low income taxpayer clinics and they are um, clinics that provide representation in tax disputes to low income people which is defined as individuals whose household income is under 250 percent of the federal poverty level Representation is free. There is a, at least one low-income taxpayer clinic in every state. And you can actually um, find the low-income taxpayer clinic closest to you um, by looking on the IRS website and, and actually typing LITC into the search function. Wonderful. Great. I do not see any other questions now. I just mm -hmm. want to bring up something um, that Jamie touched on from the IRS perspective. But if yeah. your uh, divorce decree or stipulation or agreement says um, one thing about taxes and something, you know, let's say it says the non-custodial parent is supposed to claim the children and the custodial parent claims the children, um, the IRS is not going to deal with that, but you can go back into the court, into family court, and that's that's a contempt. It's a contempt of court, and you can file for um, a relief based on that, whether it be economic or some other form of relief. And we I, we have had cases where the non-custodial parent has has improperly filed for the child repeatedly, and um, and the court has imposed significant sanctions on the non-custodial parent because there, how many times am I going to go back to court with the same thing? So, um, so there are mm -hmm. some remedies within enforcement actions within a divorce 
or child support or other issues that are not directly through the IRS. Um, there are a couple more questions here, but I'm not sure about time. How are we doing with timing, Sarah? Yeah, um, and thanks for the questions. Certainly keep them coming. If we are not able to address them now, we'll make sure to follow up with you all um, via email um, and some other TA. We have about 20 minutes left, so I would kind of toss it back to Jamie and Laura and Erica to your point that, you know, a larger question about how to um, make connections between how family lawyers can kind of set up um, things. Our next section is kind of talking about representing um, survivors and, and different ways to do that. So Jamie and Laura, if in the next 10 minutes, um, so ending at 3.50, if you want to maybe pick off, peel off some of the um, key things that you're hearing and feel like sharing, um, maybe we can kind of close on that before we do some final chatting if that works for you too. Okay. Um, well, perhaps we can pick up with a couple of the salient points on um, with the slides. So there are, on this particular slide, some tips for um, representing abuse survivors. And one of the things that I want to highlight is the last tip um, and the importance of making sure that IRS has a reliable mailing address for your client. So many survivors leave the um, marital home or the home that they've been sharing with their partner, and um, IRS continues to send mail addressed to them to that address. IRS, and so they never know what's going on with the tax return where they, you know, the, uh, a tax return may be audited, and their name may be on that tax return, and they have no idea what is happening. Um, IRS does have a form. It's IRS Form 8822, which um, you can help your client use to make sure that IRS has a reliable mailing address, and, um, we'll, and that way your client will get notices of audits, of collection activity, um, and we'll be able to um, respond appropriately. I had mentioned earlier that there was a, a remedy for um, a, an individual who files a joint return and, and it's your client's share of the refund is taken to pay the other spouse's individual debt. IRS Form 8379 can be filed with the return to avoid this from happening, or it can be used after the fact to um, get back a portion of a refund that has been taken um, to pay a spouse's individual debt. I also want to just touch quickly on um, an issue that has come up in previous webinars. Um, how do you split a refund from a joint return um, in a way that will um, both protect a survivor's privacy and safety and um, at the same time make sure that the survivor gets um, the share, their share of the return. And unfortunately, the mechanics of doing this are tricky and they're not really satisfactory. Filers can designate. Um, up to three accounts into which portions of a refund will be deposited, but there's no way to do this without revealing information about the survivor's bank account. Now, a portion of the refund can be issued in the form of a paper check, which is which may may be a little bit better. Um, and um, you know, the, it, this is something that has come up, and there, there's really no sort of perfect um, solution about this, or to for this. Um, I think we've gone over this stuff, um, but sometimes people ask me, um, family attorneys, does it ever make sense for my client to give up the exemption? And the answer is yes. Um, the, most, the, the most common situation is when your client for example, only has SSI income, does not expect to have anything but SSI income in the future, and won't benefit from the exemption. 
If the other parent works, gets the exemption, it may improve the chances that the survivor will actually receive child support um, and may be able to give up the exemption to negotiate for a better settlement. So some tips for the divorce decree or the settlement document. Um, the document should always allocate certain child tax benefits if that is being discussed. It can always state which parent should be claiming. You can divide the children, as we often do when there's more than one child. Um, and um, you can state who, which child specifically is going to get the dependency exemption. Um, documents, the document should address the future years up until sometimes even over 21, depending upon what, when you can stop claiming a child, and that's going to depend on the child, what the child does. Um, they can condition, as I said, the non-custodial parent that they cannot claim the deduction unless, or the exemption unless, they've actually paid a certain percentage or all of their court-ordered support. Um, but as we have stated many times, the IRS is not bound by the family court decree. And so, um, you know, without the forms, without the documentation, you really need to um, remember that the IRS looks at the decree but is not bound by it in any way. And that also goes for alimony. Um, there's a significant number of cases regarding whether alimony is considered alimony or not. So, um, Jamie, do you want to mention anything on this slide? Jamie, are you on mute? You, you might be muted, Jamie. We don't know for sure how IRS is going to um, deal with some of the new tax law changes, um, but um, they're there may be um, there there may be some ways to describe a child um, as a dependent um, you know which parent can claim the child as a dependent and for the child tax credit and that may be the best way to at this point to to structure a decree um, following the new law but again it's you know it's it's all very new and we all need to be watching for um, the IRS publications as they start to come out. Some other tips for the court decree. Um, you can address in the, the decree, if the parties are married, um, who's, if there is any future tax liability, who's going to have to pay that. Again, this does not bind the IRS, but it, then you you know, if your client winds up having to pay tax liabilities, they can go back into court for um, an enforcement action because the decree might have said that the other spouse was supposed to pay that. Um, and we put that a lot in our divorce decrees, specific paragraphs about if there is any liability, who's going to pay it. Um, so, and um, just briefly, some quick tips, things that we didn't touch on child support is not taxable and it's not uh, taxable to the recipient or a deduction to the payer so the reason we didn't bring up child support is because it's a non-taxable event um, we did speak about alimony and just remember the rules are changing um, and uh, and the rules are also changing both for the state as well as the IRS which is federal um, you can elect to use the new alimony rules. You can decide to use something different according to what um, what the the new tax codes have come into to play. And remember, if you modify a decree about alimony after January 1st of 2019, then that too will have an effect on the taxability. So. Um, and then, Jamie, collection alternatives. So IRS has a lot of tools to collect tax, and they generally are very invasive. Fortunately, IRS offers alternatives to collection, and one of the things that works well for um, low-income 
taxpayers, particularly in the short run, is to be put into currently not collectible status. Um, if it's going to cause hardship to pay the tax, then IRS um, after hearing about the taxpayer's income and assets and expenses, will frequently agree to take no action to collect the tax other than keeping refunds that may be due from future tax returns and applying them to the debt. IRS, um, it's very easy to negotiate an installment agreement um, with IRS for monthly payments that will either fully or partially pay the tax. Um, the IRS also, also offers a settlement program called the Offer and Compromise, um, where it will settle a tax debt for less than what's owed based on what the taxpayer can afford. But that's something that you really need a tax professional um, to do. And, and I would advise anyone who's facing tax collection to work with a tax professional. We've listed the um, IRS disclosure rules. Um, and uh, the only thing I guess I want to say is we've listed who IRS will disclose tax information to. Um, IRS will not disclose tax information to um, a divorce court, but the divorce court may require your client to disclose tax information to um, their, their spouse. Um, and we've just listed a few more pieces of information about tax disclosure. Um, on this slide are a list of inf uh, different types of information that taxpayers can get from IRS about their own um, tax situation and how to go about getting those, the forms that you need. Before we get to tax resources, I just want to briefly mm -hmm. mention, um, so there are other issues that involve taxes when parties get divorced, such as dividing up retirement accounts by using a qualified domestic relations order and the sale of houses. Um, we didn't have the time to deal with all those, but just remember that every transfer of money could possibly, possibly create a taxable event. Um, and so anytime you look at transferring of any properties or assets in a divorce, if possible, you need to, to reach out to a tax expert who could say what tax impact that might have or not have. So. Mm. Thanks, Laura. Um, and thanks, everyone. Uh, this is Sarah again. So rather than um, go through these slides on resources and partnership, I figure we could take um, some of our time to bring Jamie, Laura, and Katie back for kind of a final word in resources and partnership building that I think will segue nicely into our conversation next week. And while they do that, everyone who's still on the line with us, um, as you know now, this is why we do two-hour webinars on this issue because there's so many things. So please let us know if you have a particular case or issue that you want to kind of work through more. We'll follow up with you and send any final final questions. So um, we can do a little round robin again. Um, Jamie, um, final word on tax resources and, and partnerships? Well, there are never enough lawyers, whether it's in the family law context or in the tax context, text, to help everyone who needs assistance. But I encourage those of you who have access to a low-income taxpayer clinic to refer your clients there. I encourage you to take a look at the Taxpayer Advocate Services website and see what kind of assistance they can, they can offer. And then finally, um, particularly for those of you who are um, attorneys, if you're members of a state bar association, um, State bars are often looking for ways to promote pro bono work for lawyers and tax lawyers, um, not the ones who work in low income taxpayer clinics, but the but but the ones in private practice, are always looking for ways that they can do pro bono work, but are often clueless about what kind of work they can do. And you may be able to work with the tax section of your state bar association to help develop. Um, 
at least a list of lawyers who would be willing to give pro bono advice to you and and your family law clients as they go through um, as they go through divorces and, and and similar court proceedings where tax issues are are going to be you know significant. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And we will talk about this next week. Laura, final word generally and on resources, partnerships from where you sit? Um, so I would like to say that a couple things. One, the IRS website has publications put out on a variety of topics that are, are very helpful. Um, I, I have actually carried them to court and shown them to the judge in a family law case to explain why my client cannot file this status or why mm -hmm. um, they're entitled to the kids to file the children. Um, and I would also urge you to look, there, are, there is free filing for the IRS, which is your federal return. There are also free filing sites, some of which are put together by low-income taxpayer clinics um, to file your state return online also. Remember, um, most of the time you're filing both returns. So there are a lot of resources out there um, if you're not near a, lo a low-income taxpayer clinic. Um, but, uh, but, you know, obviously the best advice is from a tax professional, tax attorney professional. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Katie, from where you sit, final word and resources partnership? Great. I know as an advocate it was really important for me to have relationships with some of the LITCs in our community and understand what they offer there and sometimes even having the opportunity to go with a client and see what the process was like um, was really helpful in, in creating connections, um, knowing who's doing the volunteer income tax assistance in our communities um, and also knowing um, for those of us who aren't lawyers who are doing tax um, law especially. Um, in our communities, I think are, are really important. And being um, really humble and learning from those folks has been a really helpful process for me. And I know that I have been very humbled today listening to Jamie and Laura and the rich mm -hmm. amount of information that they shared today. Um, and if you want to join us and continue to learn more about tax and the of balance in a little bit of a different format, we really hope that you'll join us next week. Um, it will be a little different. We'll have two um, folks sharing their information with us, the Taxpayer Opportunity Network um, and the Kentucky Coalition Against Domestic Violence will share their experiences um, of, of running LITCs, of um, giving concrete strategies for implementing tax work that you may be able to look at to see how you could use that within your organization. And then after learning about their models, we'll actually go into small groups with faculty from today's webinar and next week's webinar. So you'll be able to be live and ask live questions more about the strategies, more about specific um, trends that you're seeing with needs around tax and family law, talking more about strategic partnerships and building in this arena, and also discussing how to explore system change. So we really hope that you will consider joining us for an, another deep dive, but a little bit of a deep dive in a different way, in a different format, and um, really just hope you will join us. If you have questions about that beforehand, you can email um, Sarah Wee at the CSAJ. Yes, please. Email me for anything, everything, um, and you'll see the, the slides that um, I won't be able to answer many of your tax questions. I'm in the boat of it is, <laughs> it's just still filing my own, and that's why I like having friends like Laura and Jamie. Um, so um, join us next week to think through that. Um, you'll see that I skipped through a bunch of, um, of those green slides. That was just to summarize some of the case scenarios that Jamie and Laura walked through with a few um, added details. So hopefully they work as a good resource for you all. Um, as we close, I won't go through all of this, but in addition to what we provided today, CSAJ, um, because of Laura and Jamie, also has a ton of additional tax and family law resources. So go to our website, check things out, and then let us know what other questions you have, how we can support you and what you're seeing and um, some questions that you have. Um, we have a whole bunch of other resources too. I'm just going to scan through these. Um, we want to hear what you're doing. We're spotlighting innovative work, so um, reach out to us about that as well. 
Um, and don't forget the guidebook that we've been referencing today, as well as some other resources. So um, I might invite Erica back just as a final, um, a final word um, while I scan through some of these other resources. And um, thank you all so much for joining us. Yes, um, this has been wonderful and, and rich with information and strategies. And um, I'm really looking forward to um, the next webinar that will um, be focused on the partnership building aspect. Um, aspect of this work as well as other sort of um, ways of creative innovation and partnership um, and both institutional within our own organizations and also community-wide. So um, hope you all will join up for that. Um, deep, deep gratitude to uh, Jamie and Laura and Katie and Sarah. Um, for all of the thoughtfulness and work that went into today's program. And of course, big thanks to the Office on Violence Against Women for um, supporting today's programming, and to all of you for your participation and engagement today. Um, we look forward to continuing this conver conversation in other spaces. Thanks so much.